Hello everyone, and welcome to Lawrence Plays Factorio Space Exploration and Crastorio 2. We've hit the rather uh, large milestone of having completed all of the basic space sciences, including the sort of the slightly weird extra ones, and so we decided this is a good place to draw the line and call this the end of series 3, beginning of series 4. And so, as is traditional, I'm going to give you a, a summary video where I'll talk about how the game has been going so far, everything we've been up to, and what's made each of the series is. Series 1 was all about Norvis and getting the initial sort of main bus up and running with all of this stuff across here, getting all of the basic resources in, doing all of the normal ground-based sciences, and then finally escaping up into space to go to, to, go to, go to Norvis orbit and start messing around up there. You'll be pleased to know I'm not going to talk through how a main bus works, because I think I've, I've done that enough times, but I do want to touch on a few things that we've done down here, especially where, the, where, they sort of, where they're more relevant to later series. Is, is, is. Our current state-of-the-art smelting systems are still pretty much the same as they were in Series 2, and looking at these, we're actually using relatively low-tier modules in here. These are all Tier 2 uh, productivity and speed modules. Um, and so, But the idea behind these is, is rather than just bringing in iron and then cooking it in a furnace and getting out some plates, if you, if you go through a few extra steps, if you enrich it with acid first and then you melt it in a, in a furnace and then you cast it into an ingot, either an iron or, or a steel ingot depending on what, you, what you're looking for, then you get quite a bit more out compa for, compared to what you put in. So we've done that and that's given us some significant boosts over here and we've done exactly the same sort of thing with copper over here as well. So we've got, we're bringing, in, bringing it in, enriching it, cooking it, uh, melting it and then turning it into ingots and that gets you that the, uh, a nice, nice big boost and once again all of this is running on tier 2 modules. However since then, during series 3, we've taken it a big step further. We've started implementing, we've started using the more advanced machines. So here you can see the advanced furnaces uh, making glass. We have advanced chemical plants as well. And those are great. So in, in Crastorio you get you get extra machines in, in, the, uh, in the various different um, tiers. So for example in, in, in Vanilla Factorio when you're looking at your uh, crafting machines, if you, when, you, when you're going through your, let's say, chemical plants, you get you get just chemical plants, and they will do chemical stuff. You also get a few different levels, tiers of um, assembly machines, and, and a few different tiers of furnaces. So you go from stone to steel, which are a bit faster, but basically the same. Then you move on to electric furnaces, which don't require a fuel source because they use electricity, and you can start putting modules into them. And then in space exploration, you get the industrial furnaces as well, which are bigger and faster, running at twice the normal, twice the speed of the electric furnaces, and and allowing you to put more, far more uh, modules into them. Then with Crastorio, you also get the advanced furnaces, which are twice as fast again, but they don't let you put more modules in. On the chemical plant front, though, you go from chemical plants to advanced chemical plants, which are again a Crastorio thing. These are eight times faster than the normal chemical plants and allow you to put lots more modules in. So these are much, much better and are very, very useful for, for um, upgrades, both because you can, both because you don't need as many machines because they run faster. Making this system over here out of, with um, with normal with, with industrial furnaces or even worse with electric furnaces would cover a huge area. And because we've started now using the wide area beacons, which take it, which mean you get much more of a speed influence over all these machines. That that reduces the number of machines you need even further. And the other benefit of that is that you require a lot fewer modules, so again you can, you can get away with using higher tier modules without spending quite as many resources on, on making the modules. Granted the whole thing will use enormous quantities of power, but power is cheap because by this stage of the game you tend to have massive solar arrays. And so using all those advanced machines means we can make, make assembly areas like this that are relatively small but have a huge output of, in this case, glass. And similarly, down here, we've got an area where we're doing similar things with stone to make the various different modified types of stone. Now, we can't use the advanced furnaces down here. You're just the, the recipe just won't let you because they don't support it, apparently. So we've got the electric furnaces here making bricks, but then we're down here we've got... Well, actually, we've only got tier 3 assembly machines down here, but um, never mind. If we look a little bit further down, the thing I actually wanted to look at is down here we have the advanced, the tier 4 advanced assembling machines. And these are, again, the same sort of thing. They run really, really fast. You can put loads and loads of, um, of modules in them. And uh, so you can see here we've got this steady, we've got almost two two blue belts of uh, a copper cable coming out of this one machine here, and then a solid stream of green circuits coming out of the uh, out of a single assembly machine. So these are amazing; they're really really fast, and this allows you to make the uh, the sheer quantities of all of the different circuits and everything else you need without having an absolutely enormous number of machines. It keeps everything a little bit more condensed, which is good for our UPS, and we need all the help we can get on the UPS front because we're currently running at about 41, um, and that's without me streaming. So when when I am streaming, it gets, it gets even worse. And all of this throughput of extra ingredients down here has then allowed us to flee the planet and go off and do more, more useful things. 
At the end of Series 2, we built our first space elevator, and that was where we drew the line. And now, if, now for Series 3, we've, we've, if we've implemented that, we've started using it. And now, as you can see here, we have a whole ar array of stations across here. And each one of these ones across here in the middle section is taking in lots and lots of different ingredients from a sort of a bus system down here that's bringing in all of those ingredients that are being made all over the solar system at the moment. They're being brought in here by belt and then passed into the trains. And we've got a system over here where the where the, uh, the the top end will send down a request saying, "Hey, I would like all of these things." And it comes down to this uh, this signal receiver here it gets passed down through the through the cables, and then all the way along here, if we ever see a less than zero, then we can pass that resource through. It'll get loaded into the train and taken up. This is basically the same system we were using before when we were sending resources up by rocket, but instead of sending it by rocket, which is hugely expensive because you have to make all of the rocket parts and you have to make all the rocket fuel, and that's just a a, a massive headache and a massive faff. Instead, we're putting it all into a train, which is, and then the train just runs on battery power, which is basically just electricity, although sometimes you do need to rebuild the batteries. You do also have to have to maintain the space elevator, and that's relatively expensive in and of itself, because as you can see here, it run, it works through a certain amount of... Um, it has a stack of elevator cable in here. As you can see up here, it uses about four cable per minute, and then there is also an additional cost of very, very small amounts per train that goes up. So you can see here that sending up one of our trains, which is has two wagons and two 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 uh, locomotives, will cost somewhere in the region of 0.4 cable. So you're paying about 0.4 cable for each one you send up, and, and the uh, space elevator cables are relatively expensive. At the moment, we're using this recipe, which uses some holmium, some iridium, some air, uh, some beryllium, and some coal to make a piece of cable. And so, as long but as long as we've got a decent supply of these things coming in, and we've got just about enough coming in at the moment, then this is a fantastic way of getting resources to and from space. And it's much easier, much cheaper, and just generally much better. And so along here, we've got the same sort of thing. So we've got different trains for different areas of the space station. So this one is going for the mate up to the main space bus, and then we've got ones that go off to all the different science areas, and, and so on and so on. We've also got various things being brought down from space. So we've got all these stations along here allow a train to pull in so this, uh, to, uh, to, to drop off some, some uh, resources. So for example, a train could pull in here to unload a load of vulcanite into this warehouse and then these ground trains can take that vulcanite away to be used around the factory on the ground wherever it's needed. Perhaps it's needed to make pyroflux in order to make the uh, in order to do the smelting or perhaps we're putting the vulcanite into the productivity modules that we need all over the place. So we can do we can create all of these things down here fairly easily. And then we've got other trains as well where for example this one's brought in a load of mineral water which has then been dropped off here and is now it's now going off to go and get some more. So a train can come down, grab some mineral water to take that up to space. Here we've got iridium that's being brought down. Here we've got the uh, holmium being brought down. Here we've got beryllium and, and so on. So all these things are being brought up or down as is required. For the, um, for the for the system. These trains then come up the space elevator, so they'll pop out here, and then they can go off to wherever they're needed. So, in the example of the um, the, the main the main space bus train I was talking about earlier, that comes over here, it stops in this station here, everything unloads, and it goes into the into the space bus. And I've talked about this a little bit before, but the basic idea is that everything gets put into this yellow warehouse at the top, and also any random stuff that gets picked up by bots will also be put into this warehouse. This all then rattles down through here, and we've got we've got we've set up filters on all of these inserters to make sure that only the things that should be being passed passed down are in fact passed down and then from each of these warehouses we can then have a, a belt of whatever the resource whatever the appropriate resources so here we've got coal plastic sulfur glass and iron and then we've got and, and so on all the way down here with all the different resources available and because these are green warehouses if anything any of this stuff is needed by a player or by a uh, by or for construction or anything like that then the bots can fly over for, for example if we needed any blue inserters they can be grabbed out of this warehouse anything that isn't needed on these belts will be put into the warehouses down at the bottom so you can see we've got some extra um, bits and pieces of, like belts and f flooring and, and, and so on in, in these warehouses down here. So those are, will again be grabbed by the bots and taken away to wherever they're required. With the, with the system up here, we, we've, you, we've gone for all in on, on trains. As is fairly traditional, at least for my the way I play space exploration, we've got this sort of big spine up the middle, and then we've got the various ribs coming off it with the various different different bits of the factory. So in here, for example, we've got the main uh, the bus, and the bus is there to basically produce the buildings and things that are needed to expand the space station. So we don't have it producing um, any of the science, but, well, we don't have it producing most of the science. There are one or two that are being produced here, but this is mostly for infrastructure projects. And then we've got biological science, and the energy science and astro science, material science, and so on, all, all being built around here. And then a science park in the middle here that actually does the research, makes the science park, does the research. Because each one of these um, areas will produce the catalogues for that particular science. So for example, over here, this is this is material science. So we've got all the resources being brought in here by train. Then they're being turned into the, uh, in, into the testing packs down here. And then
then up here, those are being turned into all of the different um, types of, of data card. So, for example, along here, we're making cold data, hot data, pulling data, and presumably pushing data. Yes. And then those are all being turned into material catalog one. And then you've got, an, uh, and then then you're making the next tier up of exotic um, material. So the the iridium is being turned into iridium girders, and then you're making another four types of data cards along here, which are all then being turned into pack two. Then you make the next tier up of the um, of the Iridium things, so in this case Iridium bearings, and another four data cards, and finally you make the, the tier three catalogs, and same same again up here to make the tier four catalogs. Now I say that we're making the intermediates up here, that's actually a little bit out of date. Then we're they are no longer being made up here because we reckon that's inefficient. And one of the things we did as part of um, series three was put in this area down on Norvis, which is making all of the intermediates. So for example, here we've got the beryllium stuff being made. So we're bringing in beryllium ingots. So those are being those are coming being brought into the space station. They're brought down by a train, then they're brought over here by a different train and then they're processed. So we're making the um, beryllium poles here that are being taken away to wherever they're needed. We're making, um, and then we're making beryllium scaffoldings that are being taken away to a station so they can be tra transported off by this train and offered up to wherever they're needed. So for example, they're needed to make low density structures using the more advanced recipe, but they're also being taken up into space to be made into, into astro science packs. Then uh, after that, we're also making them into the beryllium bulkheads, which are then being shipped off to another train up here, which is again going to take them away to be made up into made into more science and probably into spaceship parts and that sort of thing. Uh, we're also starting to make the uh, low density structures on site here as well. So we've got all these assembly machines that are making low density structures out of the uh, beryllium air, uh, scaffolds and out of glass and plastic and steel, and those can then be fed into another train, which will take them off to wherever they're needed. This allows us to make all of the different intermediates that can be made from beryllium, and the reason we're making them down on the ground. Is is because that means we can put in productivity modules because in general you can't use productivity modules in space and so using these tier 3 modules means that we get an extra 32% productivity bonus out of, out of the um, out of making these for example but then that's also stacks with a 32% bonus you get from these ones as well and from the and from this step so the beryllium it turns out will actually go much much further allowing us to make more than twice as many um, aeroframe bulkheads out of the out of each in each beryllium ingot as we would if we were making them up in space so it's, it's very very worth having, doing this down here and if we were short of any of these things then we could chuck in some higher tier productivity modules and get even more bonus throughput out of them as well. So that's the beryllium. Then over here, we're doing the same sort of thing with the iridium. So as you can see, the iridium is flowing in. It's being cut, the the ingots are being cut down into in, into plates, and then they're passed up here where they're being made into the into the girders, and then into the bulkheads, into the bearings, and then into the heavy assemblies as well. At least in theory, this has stopped for because of because of reasons. Uh, it's presumably it's run out of something. Yes, it's run out of big electric motors. That's a weird thing to have run out of. We should have, we should have a look at that. Um, but again, iridium is something we're quite short of. So actually, all of these productivity modules, we should bump them up to at least tier six and get that and get this area being uh, working much, much more efficiently. So that I think is is another thing to put on the to-do list. But as before, these then all flow over in, into the various uh, trains over here. So we've got one here where the um, the bearings can be picked up and taken away. We've got one here for the bulkheads, I think those are. Another one down here for girders. And over here, we've got the drop-off stations for all of the other ingredients that are required to make those intermediates. Down at the bottom, we've got exactly the same thing for holmium, making all of the intermediates over here. Now, this is currently very, very compact because we this this system just seems to be producing enough. So we're making the we're making lots and lots of the uh, the holmium cables, making a load of the holmium solenoids over here. And that's as far as we've got with these because the next step of holmium intermediates does actually have to be done in space, I believe. Making the process, the quantum processors is actually has to be done up, up in orbit or um, or at least in space some some part of space so we haven't got that one in here but the general theme uh, it continues around here where, where we're making each of the uh, different as much of the intermediates as we can on the ground to get us the, that productivity bonus and all of these things are then being passed over here where we are making the uh, the the, uh, the space elevator cable that I mentioned earlier as you can see that is something that we're getting through quite a bit of so there's a nice trickle of it running through here um, but we we seem to have we seem to be basically okay on it we're just refilling this belt after a, after a train came in and grabbed some so that's that's going well I think and so all of those resources are being brought up in the space elevator, brought up to space, or in some cases being taken down from space. The next step is the, is the, was the, possibly the most exciting part of series three, and that is that we started making spaceships. And spaceships are fantastic. I really, it's one of my, it's my, probably my favourite part of the of, uh, of space exploration because they're just so flexible. You can do so much with them. You but you you make your own design, your own, your own shape. You try and cram in as much storage as you can, or make them go as fast as you can. Whatever whatever it is that you're uh, that you're trying to work work towards, and then you can go in and you can program them. So there's all kinds of technical 
interesting stuff you can do with, with, with programming them up. And so in, in this case, uh, well, Mark built all of our spaceships, and they have a, they have a, a very cunning system where they basically you ha we have a standard design of spaceships. You can see they all look basically the same, and the gaps for the ones that are missing are all the same shape as well. And they have three warehouses in them, which is a decent amount of storage. And it was when they were being designed was as much as we could, as we could fit in. Um, I suspect now. Yeah, we've now well, actually no, we haven't we haven't done any more spaceship research, so they are still as big as they can be given uh, given what we know about. And so we have these ships that will fly, fly back and forth. We've got the storage space in them, and we've got them taking stuff out as well as bringing bringing stuff back. So in this case, this is this is the ship that flies out to Talos, and as you can see, it brings in beryllium, but it also takes out cryonite and vulcanite and sulfur and um, and, and and space elevator cable. And, and I think that's it. Yeah, those, those are the only things it seems to take, or the only things it's taking out at the moment. And so we've come up with a cunning system of um, basically use, just using filters on the, on the inserters, to be honest. It's not that cunning. But the idea is that it will, um, it will pass all of these things into the warehouse, and it'll pass all the stuff that's been brought over from Talos back out of the warehouse, but the, but the, uh, the, the cryonite and the vulcanite and so on won't get passed out through to here, so it's sensible enough not to do that. And then the uh, circuitry around the ship will monitor how it's going. It'll make, and once we've emptied out all of the stuff that the ship is supposed to be bringing with it, and also loaded up all of the stuff that it's supposed to be taking away, and the ship has refueled, so filled up its uh, tanks down here with ion stream, then the ship will be will be uh, sent sent off, told to depart, and head over to Talos, where it can then go and pick up a load more stuff. And as you can see, it's bringing back lots and lots of different things. So if we go over and have a look at Talos. All of our outposts work in more or less the same way, but there are subtle differences based on well, what what sort of resources you're bringing in, what's required, what you're basically what the what the outpost is doing. So Talos is a beryllium planet, so we're producing lots and lots of beryllium over here, and then we're doing it from two different sources. So we have we have core mining drills, and these will these will pull stuff out of the ground, and they 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 pull it out at a steady, rather slow rate, but but forever they never run out. And so we've got these chugging away, producing our base load, which then goes into a warehouse house, a train will come over and grab it when it's required, and bring it up, and drop it off here. That then flows out down this belt. It goes into the pulverizers here, which crush down the, uh, the in this case, beryllium core chunks, and that gets you lots and lots of beryllium out, as you can see here, with this greenish stuff, and you get a little bit of stone and a little bit of um, normal gr vanilla grey core chunks out. We then split that out down here. The, um, the core chunks can be taken away down this belt, which is also jammed. I'm going to have to have a look into this as well. <laughs> and these get processed, these get pulverized again, turned into various resources, which then get dumped onto this belt down here, and are then taken away by a train, and then, and then go into a warehouse to be taken away by a train. We, in, into the same warehouse we also have the the beryllium is or, or the beryl at this in this case is taken is then split out here it goes down round through here and it's then processed through through these machines down here so this is one where we've upgraded it to all of the advanced machines so here we've got as you can see advanced chemical plants and there's multiple stages here so the first one turns the beryl ore into beryllium sulfate by mixing it with sulfuric acid and it produces some byproducts as well then we can turn it into a beryllium hydroxide and then into beryllium powder and then once we've got the powder we can then cook it with some pyroflux into molten beryllium which can then be assessed, turned into, into into the ingots here and these also go down the disposal belt that run down all the way down here and also go into this warehouse this warehouse is where everything gets sent up back up into space. And so from here, a train will come down this elevator, which is the elevator on a different planet. It'll drop in here. It'll empty out the vulcanite and the uh, and the cryonite and any sulfur that's been brought down here, because, as I say, we need all of those things in order to do the processing over here. Uh, so they're being brought out by the spaceship and by the train, and it will then pick up a load of beryllium and miscellaneous junk. So as you can, it's, with it all being fed in here, we've got we've got a, a mixture of stuff. If I sort it, you can see we've got a load of stone, a bit of iron ore, a bit of copper ore, some rare metals. But then most of what's in here is the is the beryllium ingots, the stuff we actually want. And looking at the opposite end here, with the train will then come up come up to stop here. It'll unload all of that stuff where it'll flow along the uh, the belt over here, go into a warehouse, and then fill up these warehouses where when the spaceship arrives, it can be dropped into the spaceship. And so that sort of that's a sort of neat summary of the system. You we dig up we dig up the ore from the ideally from the core miners and then to, and then pulverize it down into into useful resources we split off the uh, the core chunks one way and then turn the beryl into beryllium all of that the the core chunks then get processed again all of that stuff flows into the warehouse over here it goes into the train then goes into the spaceship which takes it over to Norvis where it gets unloaded put into the warehouses here and then into another train which then trundles over this way all the way over to the space elevator 
where it goes down the elevator and then gets brought over to the beryllium drop-off station over here where it can then be taken off to be made into into other other parts we do also have um, beryl ore being brought in from normal mines and this is designed this is intended to be a top-up so mo in, in th ideally we want to get all of our beryl from the uh, core mining if we can because that's an infinite supply it's never going to run out it's going to be continuously produced at a certain rate so we want to always be turning that into um, beryllium if we can and uh, and then just and, and use that as the main supply however sometimes if the if we're getting through quite a lot it's we're not able to produce enough from the core mining and so at that point we have normal mines like this where we have normal mining drills that are dig digging up the barrel out of the ground putting it into into a train another train system and those trains are the ones in the queue along here that one's empty. I don't know why that one's empty. They unload into a warehouse here, and then that also feeds off to another set of um, barrel production machines here. So there's, a, there's a, a, another another column here that's producing the um, beryllium from from barrel ore that comes out of the mines. Then there's another two full setups of it down here, and if we follow these belts over all the way over here, then we can find another two and another two. So we've got a lot of potential here to produce the beryllium really, really quickly if we need it. But in theory, we'll be producing it as much as possible just from the uh, from the core chunks as as, as long as as much as we can. All the other planets work in much the same way. So this is Agnea, which is our big vulcanite planet, and here we can see again you've got the the vulcanite core chunks coming out of the coming out of the train system. They're being pulverized down into vulcanite and stone and and, and core chunks. Again, the core chunks are being processed down over here in exactly the same way into the various into the mix of different ores. And you can see there's some b barrels coming through here as well. Those, those are taking away pyroflux that we don't need on this planet. Then the vulcanite ore itself is then being fed over here into these systems, and in this case we again we pull, cr crush it down into crushed vulcanite and a little bit of enriched, and get some stone out as well. That all gets sorted out in this strong box over here. Then we pass the crushed vulcanite over here to be um, enriched by all, all of these all these centrifuges, and then the enriched and a little bit of the crushed then make it through into this advanced furnace over here. And again, you only need one advanced furnace because they're so fast, and that's capable of producing quite a lot of vulcanite, which they can then flow away down disposal belts down here to once again go into it into a warehouse and again this is the one that's being fed by the by the core chunks over here we've got another one we've got some more that are being brought fed by trains that are coming from normal mines and these again are all shut down now because we've got enough vulcanite and we want to use the, and we want to use the vulcanite from the core processing first for the exact exactly the same reasons which is why all of these belts are stopped but this does give you a nice impression of the sort of the the quantity of byproducts that come out when you do when you do this processing so you're getting out large amounts, yes, you're getting out lots and lots of vulcanite, sure, but you're also getting quite a bit of sand and a lot of stone out as well. And all of that flows down here and goes into the warehouse, and then once again we've got a train that will take it away, take it up to orbit, and then that can be unloaded and put into an input into another spaceship up here. The demand for vulcanite is a lot higher than the demand for beryllium, which is why there's uh, so much less of it stored up here. But there's, there's, we have now just, we've nearly got enough for the next spaceship to come along and fill up when it's, uh, when it's ready to head over here. Elsewhere in the solar system, we have again the same sort of the same sort of basic idea. So here, this is where we're making iridium out on Kothar, and Mike has been very, very busy with this. So we've got various different uh, drop-offs here. We've got, as you can see here, we've got these are the uh, the iridium core chunks that are being pulverized down to get some iridium. But because that's not remotely enough, because we need huge amounts of iridium, we've got these trains coming in. Uh, those are dropping off iridium ore, and as you can see, you don't actually get that much of it in a, in a train. So we've had to sort of rethink exactly how that works and try and get more of it brought in. But then that gets brought out here. Yeah, pulverized down into crushed iridium and passed on. The thing we've done slightly differently over here is we also have trains bringing in crushed iridium. These are coming from mines where the crushing is being done on site. So if we look over here, for example, you can see that we've got some iridium mines that are digging up the iridite. That's being brought over here and crushed on site. Because if you crush it on site, okay, you do get a bit of sand out that you have to deal with uh, separately. But you get you can you can then fit eight times as much uh, crushed iridite into a train as you can the iridite. So it's much much more efficient to, to bring it over in, in that form. Which is why Mike has started doing that. He's now so he's now got lots of it streaming in here, and then that's going into again into chemical plants that cook it down with um, with, with these uh, cation exchange beads. It produces a powdered iridium that we can then turn into blast cake, but when we mix it with en enriched vulcanite, and then that's brought over here where it's cooked down into iridium ingots, which can then be taken into a train brought over to here to the to the uh, to the uh, spaceport area where the train will unload them they'll be passed over into this train along with a load of miscellaneous uh, stuff from uh, corp chunk processing and then those can be taken back up the space elevator as as everywhere else and then unloaded down here where they can be put into the spaceship over here and this spaceship is actually parked here at the moment 
So all of the, and all of these have similar sort of things where they're bringing in the required ingredients. So for example, over here you can see we brought in some um, there's some rare metals and some enriched vulcanite in here because these need to be brought over for the iridium cooking process and then uh, they're being passed out here and then they can be take, put into this warehouse into the train to be taken back down again. We also need mineral water over here and there isn't any mineral water available on Kothar, so that's all being shipped over and that's why this ship has two warehouses and a and a fluid tank here. The idea being that the uh, the ship brings over a tank full of mineral water that can be passed out here, taken down in another train down to the, down to the surface, and then it can but it can and it can fill up with the solids with these with these two as well. So we don't we can't carry quite as much iridium away because we need to bring the mineral water in. But this system is still still feels it feels much nicer. I, I'm not going to say it's more efficient than than uh, using two two separate spaceships would be, although it probably is because we are bringing some solids out with it as well. Um, but it feels it feels quite nice to be doing everything with a single spaceship. You won't be at all surprised to learn that Njord is the same basic system. We have, I think these are, yes, these look like Holmium core chunks being brought in here. So they're pulverized down to a Holmium, Holmonite and core fragments and so on and so on. So that's all, then that's all sorted out over here. The Holmonite itself then comes around, is pulverized down into crushed Holmonite. And then over here, we've got some rather old tier one um, chemical plants over here that are turning the uh, the crushed Holmonite into Holmonite Holmium powder or wood, so something, something along those lines. And this is, this is one of the areas where I think we're very, very do an upgrade because if we look in here you can see that we we've only got three productivity modules in here and we're using the old type of beacons and those are only tier three speed modules as well so there's, there's def definitely some upgrades that could be done in here to make the system run with a lot fewer machines and run a bit more productively so i think that's one of tristan's plans because tristan is responsible for the holmium because uh, it's purple so that's one of one of his plans is to, is to get this upgraded to uh, to much much newer machines so it doesn't need quite so many uh, of these chemical plants down here that's a lot of chemical um, and then probably slightly fewer furnaces over here as well, because this is a. As you can see, there's a, there's a lot of chemical plants. There's a lot of stuff flowing through, but there's also a lot of machines that aren't being used. So we could, when we could do with quite a lot more holmium. So the, yeah, this is this is an area that is ripe for an upgrade. So I'm sure Tristan will be doing that in uh, fairly early on in this series. Bigrid is following a similar process, but because this is Vitamelange, it's much much more complicated. <laughs> so making the beryllium. It's pretty straightforward, actually. I kind of lucked out by get by choosing that one for myself. Um, I didn't realise at the time how much of a difference there was because I couldn't remember from last time I played. But the beryllium processing is is fairly straightforward. You get quite a lot out, so you don't you don't have the quantity to deal the sheer quantity to deal with. Yeah, there's sort of four or five steps in it, but none of them are particularly difficult. The iridium is difficult because you need to get so much through, and there's a lot of feedback loops in it, and it's generally quite a complicated recipe. So uh, Mike was a bit unlucky picking that one, especially as he's the uh, probably the least experienced Factorio player in the group but to be fair he has made he has set up a system and it's producing iridium it's not producing it fast enough but that's because iridium is blooming difficult we sent Mark out to do the Vita Melange because he's green and um, that is another difficult one because for, for, di for very, very different reasons. So as you can see here, the, the, it is keeping up. We've got we've got the Vitamelange core chunks coming in where they get pulverized down, and in the same way as everything else, you get the um, you get a Vitamelange nuggets out here, and you get stone, and you get um, I think you might get wood and core. I think you get core chunks out of here somewhere. I'm not sure, um, but yeah, it's a, it's a bit it's a bit of a headache. But then you can chemical plant that into the Vitamelange bloom, and then turn and then cook and then uh, cook that into into Vitamelange spice and Vitamelange extract. There's a very small chance of getting some extract out, but there is a chance and therefore you have to deal with it. He's then got all of that flowing up here. Oh no, this is this is core chunk pulverizing. I take it back. He's pulverizing it up here and then the, the, but then doing the same sort of steps up here to make the uh, make the bloom and then make the uh, make the spice and the extract. That then flows up here and then has to be purified or something. It has to be then extracted, so you put in some extract and some spice, and you get out more extract and less spice. So it's a bit like the Coverex process. Uh, you also get out some light oil for some reason. But anyway, you get yes, you get that, you get those out. You then get so you then get lots of the extract, and both of the and I think all of both of those are things we need. You need both the spice and the extract for various science processes later. So unlike um, most of the other ones, you do actually need to transport all of the different stages of it. It then goes past past on up here where it gets mixed with I think that's lithium chlorate glass. Uh, hydrogen chloride and you get this stuff the vitalic reagent 
and then you've, you've, you've so we've got a belt of that coming out, and you then process that again, and you get the Vitalic Epoxy. So Vitamelange has so many different levels of processing that it's a bit, it's a bit, it's a bit weird and a bit of a headache and a bit different. So there are there are sort of similarities, and you, you can draw comparisons in here. So for example, with the beryllium, you go through three or four steps of the beryllium sulfate and whatever, um, before you get out the ingots, and maybe the equivalent of the ingots is the Vitamelange spice here. And then with beryllium, you, you turn the ingots into beryllium poles and into scaffolds and into, into, into um, and, and so on. That's the equivalent of the, of the um, extract and then the uh, the dark green bottle, the reagent, and then the, and, and the epoxy. So, so yeah, they've both got those, those sort of steps. But the big difference is that with beryllium, the ingots are the most dense way you can transport it. So you, make, you send out the ingots and then, on the other, and then somewhere else where, it, where it's been sent off to, you can then make them into other things and they get a bit bigger again. Whereas to make a lots, lots of these things, for example, making the vitalic reagent takes eight vitamelange extracts and a, and a load of lithium chloride. Making the epoxy takes six of the reagents and then a load of the vitalic acid as well, so it's another byproduct. And then, so there's a lot of interweaving here, and they get denser and denser and denser the more you process them. So, so with this one, you want to do all of your processing out on, out on, the, out on this planet and then transport them. But the problem is, because you're transporting lots and lots of different things, you can't just do what we've been doing on other planets, where you just go, okay, here is a load of stuff. We'll, we'll chuck all of we'll chuck all of the beryllium and the byproducts into the tray. That's and, and send it up to orbit. We don't need to think about numbers. We just want to put in as much beryllium as we can and get rid of all the byproducts because we don't want the byproducts. This is much, much more complicated because we need all of these different things. You need um, you need to take over some of the spice and, and the extract and the reagent and the epoxy and even the core chunks as well as the uh, the uh, the acid and the uh, and the bio scrubbers. And all of these are needed at the other end. So you need to make sure you take enough to keep your stocks at the other end at an appropriate level without overloading on one particular thing. So you can't just let them all flow in because otherwise you'd, you'd then find at the other end you had loads and loads of spice but no reagent or something like that. So you need you need to keep it balanced. And so the trivial way to do that is to send a signal over from the other planet and then and, and, and load in load in stuff whenever that signal is less than zero because you know you, you know you need some of that over there but that leads to massive swings in the amount you have so you might end up with a spaceship going over that's just full of um, full of the spice when you don't really need that much you only need a few thousand of it for example and so Mark has been very very clever about this and he set up um, we've been calling it a sushi sort of calling it a sushi system but that's a bit of a hangover from a previous r r place where that was being used but essentially what he's doing is he's counting every single item that goes into the logistics system and then every single item that goes out at the other end. And so along here he's got uh, this combinator over here knows that there are 15,000 core chunks, 15,000 reagents, 12,000 spice, 12,000 epoxy and so on somewhere in the logistics system. So it could be it could be in this warehouse, it could be in the train, it could be in the spaceship, it could be in the storage at the other end. But he's got some numbers uh, somewhere that are set somewhere and it's not here, it's somewhere at the other end I think. That tells him that his tar that is these numbers these these are the targets and if there's ever less than that in the system then we'll start putting more of it in and so all of these numbers are set along here with, with, with these combinators so we, we can look at this one and say if there's less than 12,000 vitalic epoxy in the system then pass some through and if it passes some through then this will count up so for example if I decided I wanted to actually actually wanted there to be 14 or oh, 12 and a half thousand okay if I said I want there to be 14 and a half thousand in the system I can do that and it starts passing it through and each one that goes through here is counted so if I watch this over here eventually we'll see that 12,000 tick up to 13,000, 14,000 and it get, all gets loaded into the train and then taken taken away to the um, over to uh, Norbit where it's going to be needed. So that gets put into the train, it goes up the train, gets put into the spaceship in the same way that all the other things you've seen will do. It gets taken over to Norbit where the uh, the spaceship will unlo then unload it here. It'll go into this warehouse and then up into these ones up here and we've got counters along here that make sure there's specific amounts. It, there's always some of each of, the, each of the resources in the warehouses up here but not too much of it so the warehouses and never fill up completely, but they've always got a decent amount that they can load into the trains. And as they, as anything gets loaded into the trains, the inserters will report it. So we've got a, we've got a read hand contents pulse here, and those pulses get uh, then sent out back out through this transmitter back over to Big Rid, where they, where they, they've been converted into negative numbers, and those are then subtracted from the totals that we have over here. So as you can see, this has now gone up to fourteen thousand epoxy, for example, and so it's stopped coming through here. And so those those numbers are then subtracted. So we always know how much is in the entire logistics system. And this system is brilliant. It'll work fantastically as long as we 
never have any power issues. If there's power, if there's a power cut at one end or the other, you could you could run into some serious problems. Um, perhaps losing the numbers, or perhaps just losing a few signals that are being passed through. So it's a little bit fragile, but it does mean that the system always knows how much of all the resources are in are in the logistics, and therefore how much more needs to be passed through to be put into the system to be taken away and passed around and yada yada yada. The next thing that's fairly spectacular is, the, is what we're doing with all of the junk that's being brought out. So this is this is the um, the ship from Agnea docks here, it unloads the Vulcanite and a load of byproducts. The Vulcanite goes into this warehouse to be put into this train to be taken to any, anywhere that needs Vulcanite. Whereas all the byproducts, which could be in, in this case seems to be stone and sand, coal, bar barrels of pyroflux, gets put into a different train, and those trains drop down to Norvis and come out of the space elevator over here and then get pu pull up into, into the station here where they will drop off all the junk they've brought down with them. And then that goes down, the, that's sent down these belts all the way down here where it then gets loaded into some additional trains and these trains will then take all of that junk away to be reprocessed. And that means it gets brought from, from down here all the way up here to, uh, to this area which is our, uh, our core chunk processing. So this is the sort of the centre of where all, all the resources we use pretty much come through this area. So we get core chunks brought in from the core mines on Norvis and from any core chunks that get sent in from other planets, although that doesn't usually happen. They'll then get passed along here, they're pulverised down into the, into the resources and then all of those resources are passed into the stations over here where they can then be picked up by trains for when they're, when they're needed. The, uh, the junk trains pull in oh, down here and they'll unload into this warehouse and into this one and it, then all of the resources they bring in get sorted out. So the barrels are sent up here for deep unbarrelling, we send the iron up here, copper and, and so on, up all of these, um, a lot through all of these belts and that sends them through to, again, into the, into the same stations over here where they can then be stocked up and then taken away when, a tra when, when they're needed somewhere. So for example here we've got a, a train taking the stone away to goodness knows where. And this allows us to sort all of the all of everything that's coming th that's flowing through the factory, essentially. And in this area is considered a high priority pickup area because all of this stuff is byproducts of something that we want to get rid of to make sure the system never jams up. And so these are all treated as a high priority, and we do have some lower priority supplies that come from mines and that sort of thing. But basically, most of the supplies for the, for the uh, factory come from here. So you can see, for example, the um, the iron was stopped just then. So it, it, any excess iron was then being fed through into this um, into this recycling facility here. To be turned into landfill, but most of it makes it through and goes into the station here and gets put into a train and taken away. So these are these are just overflows, uh, but we have a decent amount of store, extra storage space available over here. And then these will take it off to be smelted down into iron plates, into or in iron ingots and into steel and ingots and that's and, and so on and so on. And that just allows us to deal with pretty much all the byproducts that are sent over from um, from other pl other planets. Now we, we as you can see down here we have quite a lot of different options. So we've got the basic ores going out here across the top and being sent up into the um, in, into the stations that you just saw. There's a lot of sand coming in particular from some planets, and so that's being pulled out separately into this warehouse where it'll then get passed down here, and I think somewhere down here, yes, this is the glass smeltery that we were looking at earlier. So a lot of the sand will be poured pour down here and be turned into glass to be used all over the place. Uh, we're dealing with sulphur and um, and methane ice are being taken off separately to be put into their own stations, and then we've got... So basically the idea is that we've tried to pick all the things that are being brought in in significant quantities are being passed out on down specific belts to be dealt with, and then anything else will be put out into this purple chest, where it'll be taken away and put into a, in, into a warehouse to, to be sort of forgotten about, and then every so often someone will go over and go, blimey, where, where's all this come from, and tidy some of it up. But uh, yeah, we, 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 we try not to think about that too much. And so all of that works very, very hard all the time just to bring to bring all of the resources to our uh, Norvis Orbit space platform, our space station, where all of the science packs are produced. And I showed you quickly with the uh, with the um, material sciences how those are being made. Over here we've got the energy science, for example, which is basically the same sort of thing. We've got the coolant being cooled up here. We're making the various different types of cards, and then down here somewhere, yes, here we've got we've got machines turning those into science catalogs, in science catalogs down here as well. Those all get then picked up by trains. As you can see, there's a train parked here, which has got a selection of all the different energy energy uh, catalogues in, in it. Those will be taken away over to the science park over here where they get they get dropped off. So in this case we've got the uh, the Astro catalogues all being unloaded here and we've got we've got limits set on the amount that can be put into these warehouses. Again so the warehouses partly so the warehouses don't fill up and also so that we don't have too many catalogues being stored in these warehouse in, in the warehouses. Catalogues are really expensive. They'll then get passed over here and I talked about this in the last um, summary video in the last summary uh, of at the beginning of series three, so uh, ch check that out if you want more details. But then we're here, here we're making the insights, then we're making all the science packs. Those then get passed up to over here where we're do doing all the science, and we've shoved in the best productivity modules we can make at the moment, which appears to be tier sevens. So over here we're getting a plus 120% bonus, productivity bonus on these. So every time one of these runs and uses up a science pack, it does 
two and a bit science packs worth of research. So that's absolutely fantastic. And up here we've got we've got the same for energy and material and biological. And this is this is why I was calling with what the system uh, that Mark's using for transporting goods over a sushi system, because over here this really is a sushi belt. As you can see, it's got the, it's got both um, vitalic epoxy and vitamilange core chunks on the on the belt here being being fed onto it. And he's got counters here that, that are counting the uh, the amount of the amount of um, core chunks and epoxy that are being put in, and then down here with the inserters, the amount that are being taken out. And so he can make sure there's all he's always got minor, he's always got 10 uh, core fragments going around and he's always got 100 vitalic epoxy bottles going around and so each time one gets taken out another one gets put in and you've just got that lovely system to keep it, keeping it topped up but at a level where there aren't too many things on the belt so the belt never jams. As part of series three, I also started making the more advanced modules because we want, we especially wanted the advanced productivity ones because productivity modules will give you free stuff and we like free stuff. And so I've got down here, I've got, I've got one of the standard trains bringing up uh, various bits and pieces from on the ground. So it's bringing up the tier three modules because we had the old module city that I showed you before uh, down there. It's bringing up um, circuits and bringing up uh, all of the iridium um, intermediates and the holmium intermediates. They get brought up to here in the train. And then we're also bringing in material catalogues, energy catalogues, and bio catalogues. And so we're then combining the catalogues and the intermediates together to make the modules, and these, uh, and along with the earlier tier modules. So in this case, for example, we're bringing in the tier three speed modules and iridium plates, turning them into tier four speed modules, passed over to here. The tier four speed modules are being turned in along with um, iridium girders, if we had any, and tier one material catalogues are being turned into the tier five modules. Then a tier, two tier five modules, a, a number of iridium bearings and a number of tier 2 energy catalogues being turned into the tier 6s and so on and so on all the way across here. And so that allows us to make up a nice nice numbers of all of the more advanced modules over here. There are a few um, inserters that have been rotated to make sure we don't accidentally make even more advanced stuff that we can't really afford yet. But this means that we've now got lots and lots of different levels of modules and all of these are being made up to decent numbers. So we've got, we've got We've currently got five in here, we've got nine in there, we've got 16 of this one and 50 of this one. But it looks like, yeah, we've run out of one of the steps of the, uh, the vitamin land processing here. Um, I'm not quite sure what that one would be, probably the reagent. But the theory is that we'll make up decent numbers of all of these and then we can go off and then boost our production elsewhere. And these modules do eventually pay for themselves. You get so much extra free stuff from using them that it makes it very, very worth having built the modules in the first place, even though they are really, really expensive. Another new thing from series three was we finished off all of the, let's call them shallow space sciences, shall we? So in space exploration and Crastorio 2, you have lots and lots of science to do. Uh, you can see across here, we have, uh, we've got the basic, we've got the basic tech cards across here. Uh, these are the ones that you make before you even leave Norvis. Uh, so the, the, they're the equivalent of the, of the standard um, science packs from Factorio. Then when you get up into space, you make the space science pack. These ones are fairly easy, at least they feel fairly easy now. Back when I was doing them, they were fairly, they were a bit more difficult, but they feel, feel easy. <laughs> and that allows you to, and, and so you chuck in a load of ingredients, you get, you get out these ones. This is the first thing you, you're doing when you come up to space. It's your first hurdle to cross. Then you also have the production and utility science packs. Those are there to force you to go off and get uh, cryonite and vulcanite and start doing things. Uh, go off, so you have to go off and make some outposts, and then you start doing these ones. And these get you the sort of the the end game stuff from Vanilla Factorio. So they get you bots and um, and stuff like that. Then you have what we call the tiers, and that's the uh, the astro science pack one to four, uh, bio one to four, energy one to four, and material one to four. And each one of those provides its own slightly different challenge. So the big challenge with astro, for example, is is yeah, cooling down enough thermofluid to keep all your all your telescopes and um, computers cold, and also pushing through enough of these blank observation frames to the, all the various different stages because you get through huge numbers of them, and so you need to you need to make sure that you're able to produce enough of them. Material science has the um, ha has the challenge of making enough enough of these material testing packs and also dealing with the huge huge quantities of scrap it produces when it's running as well so that's um, and also going off and getting iridium and iridium is its own challenge in and of itself biological science has the challenge of producing all of the different types of uh, vitamilange stuff and also then dealing with all kinds of loops and and um, and, and, pass, and and return paths because you'll find that a lot of the uh, a lot of these will t will t will bring in some sort of goop and then output it in a in a in a uh, sort of in a contaminated form so here for example we're bringing in new 
nutrient gel, but we're also outputting contaminated cosmic water. So then down here, you have to, then, so then somewhere you have to re then recycle your contaminated cosmic water back into clean cosmic water and bio sludge and other gunks and goops and things. And you have to, you have to try and balance all of those, make sure they're all getting pumped around in the right sort of orders. And you have energy science, and the challenges over here are in, in making sure you have enough electricity to be able to produce everything, and that you've got, and you've got enough holmium coming through, and that, and that sort of thing. So each different type of science has its own challenges. There are also a, few, a couple of bonus ones. So fairly early on in the in the tiers, you'll also want to do optimization tech cards, and these tend to get you researches which allow you to make more advanced versions of the of the fairly basic buildings, giving you better solar panels, for example, that sort that sort of thing. Then you've got the advanced tech card, which comes a little bit later on, and, and that allows you to get more advanced versions of some of the later machines. I think that might be behind that might be give you the uh, advanced chemical plants, the advanced furnaces, that sort of thing. So the much more much more advanced later game machines. We won't talk about the singularity ones because we haven't got there yet. But then you also need to do matter science packs, um, and that I've, I've done on the bot down here on the bottom of the energy science because there's quite a, quite a lot of overlap between what you need. And the challenge of these is that they take in lots of the data cards from other sciences. So here for the microwave bacon data, for example, you need to take in the London Eye data from a, from uh, from from energy science. And uh, oh, and also the uh, the snowflake, the explosion data from, um, from from material. Then you also need material testing packs, and you need the fire data and and the um, and the uh, radioactive data in order to make the bacon data. Down here, you need the pandas to make the imperials, and and all of these also produce loads and loads of scrap. And so you have another type of science which is kicking out loads and loads of scrap as well. So you need to really make sure that your scrap processing systems are uh, are, are working well and are on point. Uh, so as I say, again, that's that's the challenge of over here, bringing in all, bring basically bringing in all the data cards from um, from material and from energy in order to make get make these. And then as usual down here, you, in this case, you make the matter catalogs, and we're feeding them into a train as usual. And for for strange reasons, you require scrap as your exotic material in order to make the science packs. And so here over here in the science park, we have a train that comes in, drops off the matter catalogs and a load of scrap that's fed over into here, where we can then make si matter science pack one out of the uh, uh, out of those, and then feed those along along the belt down here in, into the labs like everything else. And so that brings us to red, green, grey, blue and gold data cards coming up from Norvis. Then we're making the rocket data, the utility and the production uh, science packs in up, in up in orbit. Those are being fed in as well. And the double plus good uh, data cards as well. And then we've got the four tiers of each one of these sciences. You can see them all being arrayed down here on, on different half belts. Uh, then we've got the matter science coming in over here, and finally the advanced data cards coming along on the top side of this belt. And so we do have a few more sciences that we're going to need to feed in here. Eventually we're going to get deep space sciences coming in, which my, pl my plan is for them to come down these two belts. We'll have matter science too, that'll come in on the other half of here. And we're going to have singularity data that's going to have to find a way in as well. That's probably going to come in across here and go into the side of this lab here, I guess, because... Well, where else can it go? And all of that, yeah, you just have to cram all of that into these labs, and then they produce science and work through all of all of this list of stuff that we've been busily doing. And I think that covers pretty much everything we've been up to in, in, in Series 3. Uh, so, as I was saying at the beginning, Series 1 was everything that happened on Norvis and getting up into orbit. Series 2 was getting the science up and running in Norbit, getting the rail system working, all, all that sort of thing, and then getting a space elevator, but that's when we drew the line. Series 3 was all about building up all of the infrastructure to work with the space elevator and getting spaceships up and running. And as I say, I, I really like spaceships, they're great fun. Getting all of that up and going and bringing in all of the resources from around the solar system we needed in huge quantities in order to make all of that science. And so Series 4 is going to be about leaving the solar system. So everything we've done so far has been in the solar system. So we started on Norvis, we went to Agnair for Vulcanite, and we went out We went out to Snowdrop for Cryonite, and we actually have gone out to Oliran for uh, Iron as well. But everything has been inside the, uh, inside the solar system. Next series, we're going to be dipping our way out in, into interstellar space. So we're going to go from Kalidus. Maybe we're going to have to go out to some of these uh, deep space asteroid fields in order to get uh, in order to start uh, harvesting Naquium, which is a vital component for doing the deep space space science. That's going to be the next big thing, going out much further into the depths of the interstellar void and uh, well, <laughs> we shall see how we get on with that. So come along and join us for the next stream and we'll, where we'll be uh, working very, very hard on that and also trying to keep the uh, supplies of all of the, the mundane resources and the basic exotic resources up and running as well because at the moment we have this graph down on Norvis that tells us how much we have of lots and lots of different things. And as you can see, our mundane resources, they're actually doing pretty well at the moment. We've got loads of iron and copper plates and plenty of the ores and, the, and, and, and so on across here. We're a little bit short of stone, but it's not doing too badly. 
A uh, little bit short of red circuits, but again, not not too bad. They're all in the green. Um, all the science packs, all the science data cards seem to be doing pretty well, except Singularity because we haven't done that one yet. All absolutely all of the um, the catalogs for the uh, for the space sciences are doing really really well. You see across there, all the way, all 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 green right up at the top, including even the matter science. But then over here, we can see that there are there are some there are some difficulties with some of the exotic resources. So we currently have no cryonite. We've got loads we've got loads of vulcanite and uh, beryllium. Those I just sort of vulcanite drop a little bit but we've got quite a lot of those they're in the green we're pretty happy with those holmium we have a little bit of uh vita spice we have a tiny tiny amount of and iridium we have absolutely none of so there's going to be need to be some expansion in these areas as well as us going out even further to get the naquium together so yeah there is there is a lot to do we are going we have our work cut out for us up ahead but i hope you'll come along and join us for the streams when we when we'll be working on that as we carry on with um as we carry on into series four which will be as i say will be all about the deep space stuff and look all of our data cards are disappeared uh, a train must have just picked up and it to, to be take to take a load away and we're uh, and we're not measuring the, uh, the the contents of the train and the buffering system oh well the um there's, there's still lots of them around in, in general i think <laughs> So, thank you very much for watching. Please make sure you subscribe so you don't miss out on all the other things that are happening on the channel. There will always be lots of bonus videos coming out with extra interesting Factorio stuff as well as this, as well as the streams for space exploration, the catch-up videos, and the other streams as well. So, once again, thank you very much for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye-bye.